Welcome to the Leadership Lounge, a place to kick back and listen as our experts dissect some of the biggest questions facing leaders today. I'm Emma Coon, Managing Director in our London office. In today's episode, we're talking about why there aren't more women in leadership positions. While change is happening, it's not happening fast enough. In 2023, women accounted for only 12% of CEO appointments globally. Based on the current rate of progress, public companies are 81 years from gender parity in CEO appointments. We know that diverse leadership teams are more resilient, innovative, and drive better financial performance. So how do you best develop high potential women leaders? What does an optimal CEO succession plan within an organization need to look like to support the movement of women into the top seat? And what can organizations do to retain more women leaders? In this episode, we'll be talking to some of our trusted leadership advisors who will share their perspectives on how leaders at every level can help close the gap. We'll also discuss RRA Artemis, our brand new CEO Accelerator program aimed at expediting more women to the top of organizations. But before we dive in, we'd like to remind our listeners that you can find all episodes of Leadership Lounge and Redefiners on YouTube. Also, don't forget to share any burning questions you want our experts to answer by emailing redefiners at russellreynolds.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Let's jump right in and speak to our experts on this fascinating topic. I know there's a lot to unpack. First up, We'd like to welcome Margot McShane, Leadership Advisor from Russell Reynolds Associates' San Francisco office and co-founder of RRA Artemis to the Leadership Lounge. Margot, welcome to the lounge. Thank you for having me. We know that women are underrepresented at the leadership level. This isn't a capability issue, as our research found that women were perceived as equally effective as their male counterparts in competencies such as navigating uncertainty and enabling innovation. And in some areas, namely coaching and developing direct reports, they were perceived as outpacing men. So what is the crux of the issue? Why are there so few women in the top seats? One of the key reasons is that organizations are not recognizing what good looks like other than through a male lens. So the reality is that women are underestimated often in part because they're different. Women communicate differently. They dress differently. Their leadership style is often a little bit different. So it doesn't quite fit the paradigm of what traditionally great looks like. On top of that, women underestimate themselves. So what do I mean by that? Our data emphatically says that women who are equally qualified as men perceive themselves to be significantly less qualified. It's really interesting, Margot, what, what you shared there. For decades, CEOs possessed a hierarchical and rigid command and control style mentality and a CEO's word reigns supreme, and that was seen as what leadership represented. It feels to me that we're at a turning point, that this style of leadership no longer works in today's leadership landscape. Instead, there's a switch to leaders who are more collaborative, inclusive, and who are unafraid to lead with vulnerability, a style that plays equally well to men and to women. And on your underestimation point, I wanted to welcome Hetty Pai, Leadership Advisor from Russell Reynolds Associates London office and co-founder of RRA Artemis, into the conversation. Welcome to the lounge, Hetty. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Thanks, Emma. I'm really pleased to be here as well. Thanks for having me. Hetty, would you like to tell us more about the research that Margot just mentioned and about how women are underestimating their abilities? We've done extensive research in this area, talking to C-suite leaders and other next generation leaders and asking them the question, if their manager were to leave their role, do you feel qualified to take on their position? And this is a good little vignette to explain this. In 70% of cases, men say, yep, I'd be ready. I have the confidence and skills. I'm ready to take on that role. For women, it's about 50%. So already you can see there's something here around women and their underestimation of their own abilities. Interestingly, this isn't the only issue, however. Yale University ran a study in 2021 and found when people were looking, being looked at for promotion purposes, they found that there was an inherent bias in the system and women were consistently underrated for their leadership competence and potential. So you've now got the marriage of the system seeing you as potentially less able and ready, and you've got the women themselves who are underestimating their ability and their competence. Your point there, Hetty, echoes the findings from the McKinsey Women in Workplace report in 2022 
which stated that women leaders were twice as likely as men to be mistaken for someone more junior, and that women leaders are far more likely to have colleagues question their judgment or imply that they aren't qualified for their jobs compared to men. This just shows that the authority gap is still a reality for many women executives. Hetty, let's now talk about taking action. What are some of the key things, in your view, leaders and managers can do to develop high potential women leaders? If we get to really the heart of the matter, it's to do with the succession planning process itself. And put really simply, if you made your succession planning process an opt-out rather than opt-in one, we believe you'd see true systemic change. So specifically, rather than asking people, we're going back to what we said earlier, putting your hand up, Actually, instead, let's automatically assume that everyone's in unless you tell me that you're out. By doing that, the message it's going to send to an organization that you're all in, you're all potentially qualified, you're all going to be considered is a really big deal in terms of encouraging a sense of diversity and openness and willingness to consider all as a general statement. But specifically for women, you're going to find so many more women staying the course effectively because they just naturally find themselves in the flow of it. This is something that I've consistently seen organisations get wrong. The more organisations can do to make succession processes as inclusive as possible throughout the entire succession pipeline, the better. I know one of our other colleagues, Shannon Knott, leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates Atlanta office, would like to chime in on this point. Shannon, welcome to the Leadership Lounge. Thank you for having me. You've done a lot to support the RRA Artemis research, Shannon, that we're doing across the firm. What can leaders and managers do to develop high potential women leaders in your view? We should also be assessing for potential, not just experiences. Women are more likely to assess that they're not ready for a, a stretch assignment versus their male peers. And too often, leadership roles are crafted as fixed archetypes of traditional leadership. And what we need to be doing instead is thinking about leadership as what are these women capable of versus what experiences have they been fortunate enough to have had? And Shannon, I know you're a big believer in this. Psychometric assessments can be critical in assessing for potential, not experience. It gets to the heart of what women leaders are truly capable of. Now, we've looked at some of the steps that leaders and managers can take to develop more women leaders. But what can men do more specifically to help women leaders progress? Why are male advocates so important in shifting the dial? The ally role is about advocating for women and men advocating for women. It's opening up their networks, their relationships, their connections. But too often, and this is a natural human frailty, You recognize yourself first. So people are working with and opening doors with and connections, which are in closest replication to themselves. And if we think about that, again, given that the pre-existing norm today tends to be male leaders, you are inherently, unintentionally, subconsciously further compounding the issue. It's so critical that men open up those networks and are proactively finding, developing and promoting talented and often overlooked women leaders. One way we're equipping women with these connections and creating allyship among the next generation of women CEOs at Russell Reynolds Associates is through our brand new RRA Artemis program. It's exclusive and designed to accelerate the development of women from the world's most influential organizations into the CEO seat. Margot, can you tell us a little bit more about the RRA Artemis program? and how you believe it will help move the needle for women leaders. You know, we conceived of this idea a couple of years ago, coming out of COVID. We were thinking about leadership in a lot of different ways. And one thing we noticed is that the number of women CEOs has actually flatlined. It hasn't changed in 50 years. Got really curious about this and the reasons behind it. We realized it's under-researched and not enough general awareness has been brought to it. So we created this initiative to do just that. And what a cornerstone program of what we're calling the Artemis movement is the CEO development program. It's the first of its kind. It's designed just for women. And we've specifically targeted the world's most influential companies to accelerate the readiness of more women with more influence over time. What's really exciting about this is it really does send a clear signal to an organization when a a current CEO board or head of HR collectively embrace and sponsor women to go through this program. This is such an important program, a real first of its kind. 
For the talented women who take part and receive the guided mentorship and peer development, it will not only exonerate their readiness to become CEO, but also think of the positive knock-on effect it will have on the organisations that they lead in years to come. I think what's also great about this initiative is that it's not about conformity or getting women to adapt to a male-dominated leadership landscape. It's about breaking down boundaries and charting a different path to the CEO role. I watched a great TED talk from the actress and author Lily Singh recently, who stressed that success for women isn't necessarily having a seat at the table. It's about the wider societal need to build a better table. I think that's such a powerful sentiment and what we're aiming to achieve with this program. Talking of charting a different course to the CEO role, to get more women in CEO positions is critical organisations look at their succession pipelines. In our research of the top 100 companies in the S&P 500, we found that typical CEO feeder roles are far from gender diverse, with women accounting for only 18% of CFOs and 10% of COOs. Margot, what does an optimal CEO succession plan within an organisation need to look like? to support the movement of women into the top seat. To get more women in top leadership roles, organizations need a healthy, robust pipeline of women throughout all levels of the organization. Sometimes boards and CEOs do not prioritize succession soon enough to create enough opportunity to identify women leaders, as well as think about positions that could be a route to the top that aren't necessarily traditional, traditional CFO, general manager, COO paths. On top of it, it's really important we have found that to ask women if they want to be a CEO. Women are more are less likely than men to raise their hand. And I say need to be invited or encouraged or ask if a CEO feels they have potential. Um, so perhaps the traditional CEO feeder roles are due for a rethink. Um, but also thinking a little bit more creatively about how to take your top potential women and create a path that's unique for her to get to the top. And it's been encouraging to see that progress has been made by organisations in rethinking that route to the top. For example, to be considered for the CEO position, in many cases, boards are looking for people who run business units, who've had P&L experience. However, in companies such as Chanel and Greggs, their CEOs move from chief people roles into the CEO seat. I think this shift is important and encouraging. Getting women into leadership positions through robust and equitable succession pipelines in an organisation is one thing. Ensuring they are set up for success is another. So Shannon, we've seen many instances in recent times where high-profile women have stepped down from the top job. And we know from our research that the tenure for women CEOs is far shorter than their male counterparts. On average, women are in the top seat for five years, compared with eight years for men. Why are women leaving the CEO role? Does this differ from men? It's a great question. In our research, we're finding that women's motivations for leaving are very different. For women, they are twice as likely to leave a role because they want to feel valued by the organization. Whereas for men, they're looking for increased pay. It's also worth noting that women are promoted to senior positions, often at very difficult times for organizations. And as such, they are subjected to increased scrutiny internally and externally. Organizations need to ensure that they are proactively trying to retain women leaders. And it's not just compensation and, and role and title. Those are still critically important. But it's also the conditions that help support women in being successful in those roles. Given that women are already so drastically underrepresented at the leadership level, it's important to know what's motivating your women leaders. As we've learned, it's often very different from men. And I suppose, tied to that question, Shannon, how can organizations harness the power that a diverse leadership team brings? Very few S&P and FTSE 100 organizations have achieved gender parity on the executive team. But once you do, there's this broader set of experiences you have access to, and that gives you the ability to avoid groupthink, to solve more complex problems, to have more innovative thinking, and potentially to connect more deeply with a broader set of customers and stakeholders. But in order to, to harness the power of that diversity and to really amplify the individual strengths, men and women on the executive team need to proactively work to create trust, to communicate more openly, to promote psychological safety. 
without those conditions, executive teams that have achieved that diversity are doomed to be less than the sum of their parts. That's so key, Shannon. And there have been so many layers to this conversation. Yes, it's critical to achieve gender parity in leadership teams, but it is also about what happens next. What actions you take as an organization will determine whether your women leaders flourish and you build effective, diverse leadership teams, or whether they choose to leave your organization and you're forced to start the process all over again. So our time in the lounge today has come to an end. In 30 seconds, this is what we've learned. Women are equally effective as men in leadership competencies, yet they're being underestimated and, crucially, underestimating themselves. If you switch your succession planning processes from an opt-in to an opt-out approach, you will enable systemic change and promote inclusivity. Assess for potential as well as experience when identifying future leaders. And retain women in leadership positions by examining women's motivations for staying. Are you creating an environment that truly supports the advancement and retention of women leaders? Thank you to all of our guests for joining me today. You can find out more about our CEO Accelerator programme by searching RRA Artemis. And if you have any topics or burning questions you would like us to cover in future episodes of Leadership Lounge, then get in touch. Email your questions to redefiners at russellreynolds.com. You can find us on LinkedIn and follow us on X at RRA on Leadership. You can also find us on Instagram at Redefiners Podcast. And you can now subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, goodbye.